Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. What is the positive? We were speaking a few nights ago about chronic illness and chronic pain. What's the positive in that? Because so many times when we have an illness or someone has an illness, we're told, look for the positive in that. So the question is, what's the, what is the positive in illness or pain, chronic disease? Well, first of all, what's important to remember is that what we get in the universe, this law of karma, it's not based, actually, on positives and negatives. Positives and negatives are what our mind does. The mind judges. The mind says, this feels really good. That doesn't. Chocolate cake tastes really good. Spinach doesn't. Being rich feels really good. Being poor doesn't. Success, wealth, beauty, health. These are things we tend to think of as positive. Illness, failure, poverty. These are things we tend to look as negative. Now, obviously, from our felt sense, they are. There's no argument that having a full stomach feels better than having an empty stomach that having a warm bed to sleep in feels better than sleeping on the street, that having a Tylenol when you've got a fever feels much better than not having a Tylenol when you have a fever. There's no question about that. The question becomes, what's the point of it all? Is the point of us being here just to keep feeling as good as we can for as many years as we're here? to just have as many metaphoric hot bubble baths as we can as long as we're here and to keep having the good feelings come. Well, we're actually here for a much different purpose. And that purpose is one of evolving and opening and awareness, awakening. There's so many different words that are used for that spiritual path that experiential understanding of who we are. That's why we're here. And there's no rule that says it's easier to awaken in a bubble bath than in a hut. And so that which happens when we think about the positive and the negative, it's important to remember, well, these are just labels I've given. So rather than think about what is the positive in it, think about what is the point of it. Because when we try to think just of the positive, sometimes it becomes a little too, a little too fake almost. There are some situations where you're really hard pressed to come up with a positive. I mean, give me the positive of kids dying of AIDS. Give me the, po the positive 
of what's happening in so many parts of the world today. I mean, there is no positive. And we could stretch our minds as much as we want, but we're just gonna, gonna come out with something that doesn't ring true to any of our hearts. This is, this is where spirituality has actually gotten kind of a bad rap for talking about, oh, it's all perfect. Well, sure, on some level it's all perfect. But that doesn't mean there's something positive and good about people suffering. So what we do is we shift our focus from the positive to the point. I'll digress for just half a moment. The same beautiful saint I quoted earlier about success used to do a very, very funny comedy routine about positive thinking. Um, and, and the whole sort of Western New Age mess of understanding and how, how we had sort of gotten very, very misdirected into this idea of positive thinking. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, everybody these days is talking about positive thinking, positive thinking. He said, and so my friend came to me one day and my friend is very, very, very fat. And my friend has very bad diabetes and came to me and he was eating a donut. And I said to him, but you are 400 pounds and you have diabetes and your teeth are rotten. How can you possibly be eating a donut? And my friend said, well, it's all the power of positive thinking. And he said, and so I asked my friend, well, what exactly do you mean by that? And he said, well, see, the donut has two parts. It has this ring that's made out of the fried sugary dough. And then it has this hole in the middle. And see, instead of focusing on the fried sugary dough, I'm just focusing on the hole in the middle. And so then it's okay, because in this hole in the middle, there's no sugar, there's no fat. So that's, that's what one of India's great sages has to say about positive thinking. On a, on a more serious note, um, what we do when we have these situations is rather than trying to find the positive, which feels like such a stretch, I mean, your spouse just died, your child just died. Trying to tell somebody to find the positive in that or to tell yourself to find the positive in that is insane and cruel. Because what it means is there's something wrong with you if you can't feel happy about this. That you're somehow not evolved enough to feel happy. So instead, we look for the point. And the point is, how does this situation give me an opportunity to wake up? How is this situation conducive for me taking the next step in my growth? in my experience, in my awareness, in my connection with the divine. And that becomes the question. And so when you think about illness, well, one of the things that illness does pretty quickly is forces us, if we don't want to be miserable, is forces us to recognize I'm not my body. And it's hard. I mean, I have, by God's grace, never had a severe illness. But I know just with colds and flus, you wake up in the morning with a fever and a stuffed nose. And even with that much, I don't want to sit and meditate. Even with that, there's this, oh, God, let me just, you know, stay in bed and couldn't somebody bring me a cup of tea instead? So even with that, as the body starts, 
as the body starts to come apart in different ways, it's so important for us to recognize we aren't the body. It's so important for us to connect with who we really are. And that becomes the point, is I'm not the body. I'm not the illness. Look, I'm able to be connected and happy and joyful and peaceful. Not because of my illness, but despite my illness. The illness can coexist, and my peace can coexist. And that becomes the point. To give you that lesson. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. Why we feel anxiety and what can we do about the anxiety that we feel. And so many of us feel so much anxiety for so many different reasons. Most of the the fear response is a response that we have going back from our, our ancestors of times in which We had to worry about bears and tigers and warring tribes and people stealing our land or stealing our family or tearing into our village in the middle of the night. That fight or flight response was generated out of a true time long even before that throughout our whole evolution of having to protect ourselves and survive, of having to survive. But now what happens is we have the stress response, not to bears, not to tigers, not to warring tribes, but to not getting in the parking spot. You know, somebody goes into the parking spot that we were going to go into. We have it over getting stuck in traffic that we weren't expecting to be in. We have it over losing our job or being afraid we're going to lose our job. Over not getting into the university that we want or getting the placement that we want. And our lives end up becoming full of this anxiety. So the first aspect to understand is, why do we have so much anxiety? Why, if we were created and evolved throughout hundreds of millions of years, to have this response that was all about survival, was all about just protecting ourselves to make it through the night or protecting our family, Why do we now have that response to somebody cutting in front of us in line at the supermarket? To gaining a few pounds? 
to the stock market going up or down, to getting scolded by our employers or losing a job or getting yelled at in class or not getting a good grade. And what are we so anxious about? A good way to think about it in a very simple and easy way is that the anxiety and the stress comes because we now spend our lives trying to milk, to squeeze orange juice out of a cow. Now, what do cows give? They give milk. Assuming, of course, that the cow is humanely and lovingly treated, assuming, of course, that the cow is fed only organic food and no hormones or antibiotics or chemicals or things like that, the milk that comes out of a cow is very nourishing, assuming also that you're not lactose intolerant or allergic or whatever. But it's, it's very nourishing food. But it's not orange juice. Orange juice is also wonderful. It comes from squeezing oranges that grow on trees, not from a cow. The problem in our lives is that we metaphorically are trying to squeeze orange juice out of the cow. We have something in our lives, ourselves, who we are, what situation we're in, what circumstances we're in, our families, our relationships, our physical body, our talents, our opportunities. We'll call that the cow. Now, out of that, we can get this wonderful milk. It can nourish us, it can nurture us. We can be the milk, nourish and nurture others. But if we have convinced ourselves that what we are supposed to have is orange juice, that the only important thing is orange juice, that the best thing is orange juice, and that by God I'm going to get it out of this cow, then what ends up happening is we squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze futilely. Neither we ever are able to get orange juice because it doesn't matter how sweetly you talk to that cow. Doesn't matter how much gourd or mangoes or whatever that you feed it. There is no way that cow is ever going to give you orange juice. But there's another tragedy in it. And the tragedy is that in the attempt to finally squeeze orange juice out of those cow's udders, we deprive ourselves of what it really is giving us, which is milk. And so we end up with nothing. And in our lives, we live like this. We've got a perception of what it is we need to be happy, what it is we are supposed to have, how the universe is supposed to be. We have them on the big levels, and we have them on the little levels. So everything ranging from, that's my parking space, to, but I was supposed to be much more successful. But I was supposed to find eternal love but I wasn't supposed to be betrayed or cheated, and everything in between. And when we have that vision, when we have that expectation that something other than what we're getting is what we need, then naturally we're going to be pretty stressed. And what's happened over the last many, many years but not that many, in looking at evolution, it's not that many, is our vision of what we need has gotten smaller and smaller and more and more specific. It's money, it's fame, it's success by these very narrow definitions of success. 
Success by how my culture defines success. It's power. It's the ability to have all of the things that I want so that when I see a TV commercial that convinces me that I would only be happy if I have this model of car or that condo in this place, that I'm able to buy it. That I'm able to have whatever I want. That becomes for me success. That people around me should treat me the way I want them to treat me, speak to me the way that I want them to speak to me, that the stock market should do what I want it to do, interest rates and mortgage rates should do what I want them to do, my employees and employers should do what I want them to do. So I'm literally trying to squeeze. So going back to our concept of anxiety, so we're anxious because we have a very specific view of what the universe is supposed to do. But there's a very beautiful saint who very tragically passed away last year, and he gave a definition of success that I always like to share. And his definition of success was, doesn't matter how much you make, doesn't matter what you achieve, the only definition of success that matters is how you respond to the inevitable times when the universe does not act the way you think it should. How do you respond when the universe, whether it's the weather, whether it's the stock market, whether it's your children, whether it's your spouse, when they do not act the way you think they should, how do we react? And that is success. Because the only thing we have control over is ourselves, not over the universe. And so if we spend our lives trying to milk this orange juice out of a cow, if we spend our lives trying to get something that's not there, to be someone we are not, because we are convinced that something else is better, something else is more worthy. Neither are we ever able to become that, nor are we able to become and really be ourselves. Pooja Swamiji always gives the beautiful example of the rose and the jasmine and how each of them is wonderful. The jasmine is small and white. The rose is bigger and red. The rose grows on a bush. Jasmine grows on vines. They're both wonderful. But if the rose decides that she's supposed to be a jasmine or the jasmine decides she's supposed to be a rose, Neither can they ever become each other. And we end up depriving the world of the fragrance and the beauty of both of them. And so that then becomes our answer to the anxiety, is let me stop trying to squeeze orange juice out of a cow's udder let me stop trying to find what I'm looking for in life. What we're all looking for, which is happiness. I mean, that's why we run after money. Nobody runs after money because they actually think that, you know, it tastes good. Nobody runs after money because they like to, you know, hold it against their heart when they go to sleep at night because a brick of gold feels so warm and cozy. Nobody runs after power or fame because we can eat it or love it or because it sings to us. We run after them because in our mind, that is the answer to finding the happiness and the joy that we're looking for. 
if I only have this, achieve that, go here, become this, then I'll be happy. But as we all know, it doesn't come from those things. As we achieve more and more every year and acquire more and more every year, so every year more and more people get prescriptions for antidepressants. So every year more and more people get prescriptions for anti-anxiety medicine. So every year more and more people need a pill to fall asleep at night. There is no connection between that success, that money, that car, that mansion, and my true happiness. But that's why I keep doing it. And that's where the anxiety comes from, is I've convinced myself in this moment that parking space is what I need. To be the next one checked out at the supermarket is what I need because I've got somewhere to be. And if I'm late, I'm going to miss it. And if I miss it, then I haven't just missed a meeting or missed an opportunity, but I've missed my happiness. I've missed my chance for happiness. And so in overcoming or moving from our anxiety, it's so important to understand this cow I've gotten. How can I use the milk it gives? This cow I am. How can I love the milk I am rather than trying to become orange juice? How can I be the jasmine rather than wishing I were the rose or be the rose rather than wishing I were the jasmine. And lastly, to understand that all of that joy that I'm looking for doesn't come from these things outside. It comes from within. And so my focus, yes, we do our jobs, we do our duties, but my focus is on my inner connection. On, as Pooja Swamiji says, the internet rather than the internet. Most of us think our happiness can lie in the internet. If I can just post something on Facebook and get enough likes, or if I can go to Amazon and order enough things, or if I can, you know, gamble and make some money, whatever it is. From pornography to social media and everything in between, that somehow the internet is the answer to what I need. If we use the internet and connect to that, that becomes the answer to the anxiety. Because then I don't need, whether it's the parking spot, whether it's to be next in line, whether it's the promotion. Yeah, I still want it, but I don't need it. And so it doesn't fill me with that anxiety that life or death, heart pounding, palm sweating, pulse up, blood pressure up, anxiety. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. 
Baldwin with People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Since we are on the path of spirituality at Paramarth Nikitan, it is easy to find peace and to listen to ourselves. But what about the world outside the gates of the ashram? How do we manage to keep the same peace and composure? So yeah, so this is something that comes up with so many people who come. Whether you're here for a day, a week, a month, whether you're here for a yoga program or here for a family vacation, whatever it's, it is that's brought you, we experience a, a peace, an inner connection here that is very difficult or very challenging, rather, to maintain outside. And the question becomes, how? Well, the good news is that that which you're experiencing here, that peace is actually inside you. It's not outside. I mean, yes, the atmosphere here is incredible. It's a divine place. But the peace that you are experiencing, you're experiencing it inside yourself. It's not just like standing near an air conditioner. And so you feel cool because you're near the AC or standing near a heater and you feel warm because you're near the heater. What's happening here is the energy in the place is activating something within you. It's opening something within you. It's catalyzing something within you. And that stays with you. That's in you. It's like if you come here and you meet someone and you fall in love. Are you going to lose that when you leave? Of course not. It just happens to be here in this beautiful, divine place that you met and fell in love. But you're going to be in just as much love when you leave because that love is within you. In the same way, that peace, that joy, that sense of connection that you feel, you feel it inside. But now here's how to take that back. So the good news is it's going with you because it's in you. But what happens is when we get back into our quote-unquote normal lives or external lives, we don't access the peace within us. And the reason we don't is we become externally focused. Here we are internally focused. Whether we're doing a yoga class, whether we're meditating, whether we're sitting on the banks of Ganga, whatever we're doing, we're very internally focused. We're aware of the fact that we're here in a spiritual place and we're going to do our inner work, whatever that means to different ones of us. But we recognize that and we do it. So when we're focused internally, we're able to experience that which is inside of us. When we leave, we become externally focused. Whether it's our jobs, whether it's our household, whether it's our errands, whether it's the full-length mirrors in our house, whatever it is, it takes our attention from the internal to the external. And what that means is that the reason that we lose so much of what we experience is that we're not getting peace and joy and connection and meaning in the external things. 
Sure, we may love our job. It may be wonderfully fulfilling. But it's not in that which I'm doing in my office, for most of us, that is actually giving me that inner experience of peace. It's not having a clean house. It's not getting all my errands done. It's not liking the way I look in my full-length mirror. It's not going to parties. These are all fine things. There's nothing wrong with them. If you have a house, it should be clean. If you have a job, you should like it. But we have to understand that that's not where this piece is coming from. That's coming from internal. And if what I do when I go back is focus only externally, I'm going to lose that inner connection. This, by the way, since we began by talking about falling in love here, this, by the way, is actually what happens to so many people when they get married. This is appropriate since we have our beautiful newlyweds here. Let's interject some marriage advice. When we fall in love, we are focused on the love, which is what makes it so beautiful. It's what fills us with such joy. It's what makes everything else in life seem wonderful. You know, I always say, when you fall in love, you're not just only in love with the beloved, you become a much better tipper. You become a much nicer boss. You start helping old ladies across the street. It's like that love expands to the world around you. You can always tell when, you know, a coworker or someone has fallen in love because suddenly they're saying, God, you, would you like half my sandwich? Or shall I, shall I do that work for you? Things that have nothing to do, I mean, you're not the one they're in love with. But that love is so pervasive from within that it overflows onto the world around us. Now, here's the key. It's because we are focusing on the love. When does the honeymoon phase end? When we start focusing on who's going to do the dishes, who's going to pick up the laundry. We forget to look inward. Now, obviously, we live in the world. Somebody's got to do the dishes. Somebody's got to pick up the laundry. We've got households. We've got jobs. We've got kids. It's not that logistics cannot coexist with love. But when all of our attention in our relationships is focused externally, we lose the connection. We still know, yeah, yeah, of course I love you. It's not that you fall out of love. It's just that you're not accessing that pure, immediate, present source of the love. So in your mind, you know, yeah, yeah, I love this person. But you're no longer such a good tipper. You're no longer sharing your sandwiches with your coworkers. You're no longer... You know, living in that love is overflowing out of me state because your mind is no longer on the love. Your mind is now on the external world. The love has sort of become something we take for granted. And the way to keep everything good in life alive, the inner peace you experience here, the inner yoga, the meditation, the connection, and the love in our relationships is to keep our minds and our hearts in the present moment focused on the love, focused on ourselves, the peace, the joy, that source within, we do things in the world. It's not, oh, sorry, I can't 
you know, do my job because I'm too busy being in love. We're not talking about calling in sick days to stay in bed. We're talking about staying anchored in the real truth of who we are, which is that source. It is that presence. It is that existence of peace, of joy, of love, of connection, and not letting ourselves get into this subconscious autopilot. Think about it for a moment. You get in the car at the office to drive home. You arrive home. Most of us have no recollection of how we managed to get home. We know the route so well that we're able to drive our cars on autopilot and have our mind be someplace else. You get home, you think, oh my God, you know, and somebody says to you, oh, did you see such and such on the way? You don't remember anything from the way. Because our minds were someplace else, we are able to navigate our way home on autopilot. But if you're in a new city, or in your city, but going to a new place, your GPS is not working or it's off. You've got directions. You've got to pay, pay attention to where you're going to turn left, where you're going to turn right. Now suddenly you can't be on autopilot. Now suddenly your mind can't be elsewhere. It has to be here. Now this is fine for driving our cars. No problem with getting yourself home on autopilot and giving yourself the freedom to think about something else. But in our lives, in our inner lives, in our spiritual lives, in our relationships, we don't want to be on autopilot. You don't want to be able to, to start learning how to drive your marriage the way you drive a car of, well, I don't have to pay attention because I've been doing this for 30 years. In order to keep it alive, we need to stay present. And this is true with your, your yoga. The way to take it home with you, to take that experience home, is to stay present. When you're doing your yoga here, when you're meditating, when you're sitting on the banks of Ganga, you're present. You're here. You're focusing on the yoga, on the meditation, on the connection, on the love. Take back that technique no matter what you're doing outside, allow your awareness to be within. Allow yourself to continue to experience within that sense of peace, because that's in you, as I said. That's going home with you. But just don't allow the mind to shift from the inner to the outer. Doesn't mean we don't pay attention at our jobs. Doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to the things around us. But we can do that while still being present with ourselves. In fact, what you'll find is you're better at the job because you're not on autopilot. You're better at the tasks because you're not on autopilot. That same bringing of awareness and attention to the moment not only helps you stay peaceful and connected and joyful, but ironically, it actually also makes you much more efficient and much more functional. So it actually ends up working on both levels. And that's what you take back. And then every minute can become yoga. Because what yoga is, is union. It's a union of our breath to our bodies. It's a union of our minds to our muscles, a union of our mind and heart and soul and spirit. But ultimately, it's a union of our self to the divine. And you can do that anywhere. You should do that anywhere. God is everywhere. And so whether you're going to now have the opportunity to practice your yogic connections with your colleagues, with your coworkers, with your employers, with your employees, with your social circle, with your family. This is OTRFM. 
part of the IOM Radio Network. The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub-Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. When I broke my foot for leaving me alone when I wanted to be alone. And And now, now, as a grown-up, I'm thankful for being able to take care of you, my dear mom, for taking you to your therapies, for understanding that sometimes you simply want to be alone. Roles change without us noticing. That's why AARP gives you the information to provide even better care for your loved one. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati. And thanks for coming back and joining us for more of inspiration and transformation. Can love exist without its opposite? When we think about existence, it takes us back into that Zen koan where they say, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Or if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? You know, all of these these questions that don't really have answers but that are just meant to make us meditate on that aspect of reality and take us closer to the truth. So I mention that because, well, on a literal level, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, science says, of course, yes. But the deeper level is, well, if I'm not able to experience it, Does it exist? And one of the examples of that that I speak about frequently is you're sitting here in front of me, right? Now, how do I know that? Because my eyes oblige me very nicely to function properly and to pick up the signals of your physical body in the light and to relay them back into the occipital lobe of my brain and tell me, There is a young man sitting there. Should I be blind? I could still rely on my ears to hear your voice. Should I be blind and deaf? I could still rely on my sense of smell, sense of touch, taste. But if I had no access to any of my senses, couldn't see, couldn't hear, couldn't smell, couldn't touch, couldn't taste. I would have no way of experiencing your presence here. You'd still be here, though. But it wouldn't be a part of my awareness. Now, when you think about love, could love exist without its opposite? Yes, of course. Love doesn't exist because I feel love. My ability to love does not create love. Look at a flower opening its petals. Look at a tree giving out fruit. Look at the way the natural kingdom works, the animal kingdom. Look at rivers that flow. There is love in nature. Look at a rainbow. Look at a sunset. Now, my ability to experience love has not created love. But for me, would I know love if I didn't know no love? In the same way, would I know light if I didn't know darkness? We are able to understand and experience things based on 
opposites. It's actually how our human brain works. I'm not going to get into all the neurology of this, but I happen to love it. It just happens to be my, my academic background. But one piece of it that I'll share with you is the human brain is wired toward newness, and it's wired toward difference. So for example, if you look at something for a very long period of time and it doesn't change, it'll start to blur. You can just try it. Start staring at something without moving your eyes for a while. It will lose its sharpness. The brain shuts down. The brain basically decides, all right, nothing is happening here. I don't need to give it my full attention. I've already understood what that form is. And a lot of it starts to stop responding, stop reacting. But if the shape in front of me changes ever so slightly, so if you and I are, say, doing a meditation together and we're staring into each other's eyes and neither of us is moving, neither of us is doing anything, eventually I'm going to see you kind of start to blur. But then if you smile or you sneeze, suddenly you're going to come right back into full focus for me. And how is that going to happen? Because my brain has now recognized a change. Okay, enough of the neurology. But the reason that I, that I mention that is we are therefore able to recognize things in our world based on them being different from what we were previously exposed to. It's how the brain works. So if there were only light, would we, would there be light? Would we know light? Well, of course, we would still be able to see each other, but we wouldn't call it light. We wouldn't notice it as light if there weren't such a thing as darkness. In the same way, if we all only experienced love, if we never experienced absence of love, would it still exist? Of course. But would it have that, that power? No, because it wouldn't be new or different. And that's the aspect of it. So this is where the, the opposites come in is they help us see, they help us experience, they help us understand, simply because it's how our brain works. But our experience of love, our ability to feel love, does not make love exist. Nor would our inability to feel love make love somehow disappear. Nor does the absence of indifference make love disappear. It just would make us not know what it was because it would be all there ever was. So it's more of our experience of it. Like I can't experience you without my senses even though you're there. If I'm not there to hear the tree fall in the woods, yeah, it makes noise, but not in my experience. So in the same way, love would still exist, but my experience of love would be different if I hadn't had the non-love with which to compare it. I wouldn't be able to fall in love, for example, if there had ever been a moment of no love. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Mm -hmm.